Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to all of you in the name of our Savior Jesus. It's Maundy Thursday, a day that gets that name because of an old Latin word that meant command. That's where that word Maundy came from. This evening is the evening that we remember that Jesus gave us, his church, the new command to love one another. Well, how can we do that? Only because Jesus first loved us so much. Today, as we remember the very beginning of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross, we also recall and rejoice that he instituted the Lord's Supper to show us and to deliver to us his love and forgiveness every time we come forward here at his house. So this evening we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together as the Lord's Supper is an expression of unity of faith and confession between believers. We invite the members of Good Shepherd and our Sister, uh, Sister Wells churches forward to commune with us. As we've done the last number of years for this uh, Maundy Thursday service, we're going to commune together in our traditional way, coming forward to the rails in tables. So as you come forward, you'll be ushered from each side. You can come forward and fill 10 to 12 per table. You'll be able to kneel if you would like, and then you will receive the bread, the wine, and the blessing all together, and then you can return to your seats from there. So you'll just follow the direction of the ushers, and we'll enjoy the Lord's Supper together. Our service begins with hymn 416, When You Woke That Thursday Morning. That's printed on page 16 in your service folder. God bless your worship.
this Lenten season, we've heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering which led him to the cross for our salvation. We've also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at our baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should never doubt, but firmly believe that our sins are truly forgiven before God in heaven, because it comes to us in the name of and by the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In joyful response, then, we who receive God's love in Christ are called to love one another, to be servants of each other, just as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in that love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup just as he gave them to us. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness, and participate in that new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the joyous climax of our reconciliation with God and one another. Therefore, as we begin the solemn celebration of our Lord's passion, let us confess our sins to him, receive his absolution, and be reconciled to God and to each other in Christian love. I ask you to please stand. We speak together. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us, has reconciled us to God, and has promised us the power to forgive and love one another. Relying on his promise, therefore, be reconciled with one another. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on a cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 116. Let's speak the verses responsively as they're written. We'll speak the bold Gloria Patri at the end and sing the refrains together. <clears throat> I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my because he turned his ear to me. 
for you, Lord, have delivered me from death. that I may walk before the Lord What shall I return to the Lord? I will lift up the cup of salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as I face death, turn my thoughts to your body broken for me and your blood spilled for me. Let me rise as you have risen from the dead to walk with you forever in the land of the living. I call on your name, for you have promised to be with me. Amen. Our first lesson from God's Word for this evening comes from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 12 and 17 through 20. Our readings this evening all focus around the festival of the unleavened bread, which the Lord instituted here in our first lesson. He told the Israelites to celebrate this festival every year in the spring to commemorate how he delivered them from their slavery in Egypt. Unleavened bread was the fast food of those days. The idea was that they left Egypt so fast that they didn't even have time to let their bread rise. And that's how God taught them about his deliverance from their greater slavery to sin. He wants us to leave it as fast as we can as we follow him and his word toward our own promised land in heaven. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. 
For seven days no yeast is to be found in your houses, and anyone, whether foreigner or native-born, who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. That's the word of our Lord. Our second lesson for today comes from the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. This reading will be the sermon text. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's the word of our Lord. Then out of respect for the words and works of our Lord Jesus, please stand for the gospel lesson. Today's gospel comes from Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 26. Here is Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover meal and begin the festival of unleavened bread. He teaches them how he truly fulfilled that festival by giving his body and blood to forgive and remove all our sins, first on the cross and then also in the sacrament of Holy Communion. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened. And one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That's the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. And let's continue with our hymn of the day. We'll sing verses 1 through 5 of hymn 659, printed for you on page 17 in your service book.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen, your brothers and sisters. Would you take a look <clears throat> at this beauty? Who doesn't love fresh baked bread, still warm from the oven? This is what dreams are made of right here. We love the way it smells. We love the way it looks. We love the way it feels with its crunchy outside and its soft inside. Most especially, of course, we love the way it tastes. A fresh sourdough loaf of bread like this one makes just awesome French toast and grilled cheese and so many other things along with it. But back in... Old Testament Israel days, especially at the Passover time, this right here was public enemy number one. See, back in those days before yeast came in convenient glass jars and paper packets, the way people would make bread with yeast was actually very similar to the way sourdough is still made today. Flour and water would be mixed together and allowed to sit and ferment for a number of days so that the wild yeast spores in the flour and in the air around can mix together and work through the mixture so that they can start to grow and spread. And eventually, that starter gets to a point where it can be fed and used on a continual basis to leaven loaves of bread for baking. Well, the process of baking bread took on a symbolic meaning there in Old Testament Israel. And even Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul here in our lesson for today key on that same idea. From the institution of the festival of unleavened bread in Exodus chapter 12 all the way to the New Testament church in 1 Corinthians 5, yeast in baking bread became a symbol of sin in our hearts. And God gives us this lesson in the leaven to teach us not only about the seriousness of sin, but ultimately about sin's only real solution. So I want you to think first of all about how yeast spreads. Once it gets into the dough, even just a little yeast will keep growing and puffing up until the entire batch is affected. You can't see it, but it's always there and working. Well, the same goes for the sin in our hearts. It may start small, so we like to tell ourselves, but it always grows on the inside and puffs us up with human pride. It feeds on itself and it leads into other sins. It's just like Jesus said, out of the heart come evil thoughts, desires, lusts, pleasures, and before we know it, they can totally take over our lives. And that is so dangerous because of how pleasant and harmless sin can seem at first. Again, who doesn't love the smell of fresh baked bread? You see it, you smell it, and your mouth starts to water. You just want it because you know how good it's going to be. But yet, with yeasty bread, if you eat too much of it, or especially if you have an allergy to it, it can really cause you a lot of health problems in the end, or at the very least, it can give you a bad stomach ache or go straight to your waistline. Well, again, the same is true with the sin in our lives. It seems at first like it's going to be so fun, so easy, so harmless. But in fact, sin is always harmful and it always makes our lives harder in the end because ultimately it hurts us, it hurts our neighbors, more than anything, it hurts our relationship with God. 
And so that's why God told the Israelites to be so careful about getting all the yeast out of their houses at festival time. Sweep your floors, wipe your counters, dust your cabinets, wash your clothes. Anywhere yeast could be collecting, get it out so that your house could be clean. God wanted them to be careful about their surrounding environment. And he wants the same for our spiritual lives, too. See, it's not just the devil and our own sinful flesh that tempt us to sin. It's also the ungodly influences of the world around us. Christian people need to take special care about the company we keep, about the entertainment we're exposed to, about the activities we take part in, because if we don't do our best to keep our lives and surroundings free from temptation, sin will always find us. And yet, as any scientist would tell you, that's really a futile effort. See, there is so much microscopic yeast in the air all around us that any idea that you are actually going to be able to make a loaf of bread that is totally yeast free that is 100% unleavened that's a fool's errand it's a dream it's not something that we could ever possibly achieve and once that yeast gets into the bread That's not something we can ever possibly get out again. It's too small and it spreads too fast. And again, the same is true for the sin in our hearts. We are born in sin. And no matter how hard we might try to get rid of the old yeast of malice and wickedness by resisting the devil or turning away from the world or disciplining our flesh, our own efforts could never be enough to totally rid our hearts and lives and homes of the sin that permeates them. So learn the lesson in the leaven, friends. In this world, it would take a miracle to make a truly unleavened, entirely yeast-free batch of bread dough. And it would take an even greater miracle to make and keep our lives free from sin. But you remember what the definition of a miracle is? Something only God can do. And so that's exactly what he did for us by sending Jesus Christ. What we could never accomplish on our own by our own righteousness... Jesus accomplished for us by winning our forgiveness. He lived a perfectly unleavened, a perfectly holy life for us. Not one spore of sin's yeast contaminated his flesh. And then, best of all, he gave that perfect body in sacrifice for us on the cross, and he still gives it for the forgiveness of all of our sins every time we come here to the Lord's Supper. Yes, Christ is our true Passover lamb, the one whose blood covers our hearts to deliver us from death and the one whose body sacrificed for our salvation purges the yeast of sin from our lives both now and forevermore. So on this day, And every day, even as in New Testament Christian freedom, you may eat yeast with your mouth, as many of us did at that delicious spaghetti supper a little earlier. Remember the lesson in the leaven that Jesus has cleansed the yeast of sin from your hearts. As you come forward to receive Jesus' true body under this unleavened bread, Remember and rejoice that Jesus is making you into unleavened bread spiritually with the sincerity and truth of faith so that one day you can take your place at his heavenly feast 
in eternity. Amen. And now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue our service with the great litany that starts on page 7. We'll speak it responsibly as it's written. O God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy on us. O God, the Son, redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. O God, the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide, have mercy on us. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, three persons in one God, have mercy on us. Remember not, Lord Christ, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forebears. Spare us, good Lord. Spare your people whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. From all spiritual blindness, from pride, vainglory, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all lack of charity, from all deadly sin, and from the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, from all false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from hardness of heart and contempt for your word and your will, from earthquake and tempest, from drought, fire, and flood, from civil strife and violence, from war and murder, and from dying suddenly and unprepared. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, and by your proclamation of the kingdom, by your bloody sweat and bitter grief, by your cross and suffering, and by your precious death and burial, by your mighty resurrection, by your glorious ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, in our times of trouble, in our times of prosperity, in the hour of death, and on the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. Receive our prayers, O Lord our God. Hear us, good Lord. Govern and direct your holy church. Fill it with love and truth, and grant it that unity which is according to your will. Enlighten all ministers with true knowledge and understanding of your word, that by their preaching and living they may declare it clearly and show its truth. Encourage and prosper your servants who spread the gospel in all the world and send out laborers into the harvest. Bless and keep your people, that all may find and follow their true vocation and ministry. Give us hearts to love and reverence you, that we may diligently live according to your commandments. To all your people, give grace to hear and receive your word and to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Strengthen those who stand firm in the faith, encourage the faint-hearted, raise up those who fall, and finally give us the victory. Hear us, good Lord. Rule the hearts of your servants in government, the President of the United States and all others in authority, that they may do justice, love mercy, and walk in the ways of truth. Bless and defend all who strive for our safety and protection and shield them in all dangers and adversities. Grant wisdom and insight to those who govern us and to judges and magistrates the grace to execute justice with mercy. Hear us, good Lord. To all nations grant unity, peace, and conquer and to all people give clothing, food, and shelter. Grant us abundant harvests, strength, and skill to conserve the resources of the earth and wisdom to use them well. Enlighten with your spirit all who teach and all who learn. Come to the help of all who are in danger, necessity, and trouble. Protect all who travel by land, air, or water, and show your pity on all prisoners and captives. Strengthen and preserve all women who are in childbirth and all young children and comfort the aged, the bereaved, and the lonely. Defend and provide for the widowed and the orphaned, the refugees and the homeless, the unemployed, and all who are desolate and oppressed. Heal those who are sick in body or mind and give skill and compassion to all who care for them. Grant us true repentance, forgive our sins, and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your holy word. Hear us, good Lord. Son of God, we ask you to hear us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. 
have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. We continue with our mixed choir anthem. Thank you, friends. I ask you to please stand as we continue with our confession of faith from Luther's small catechism on Holy Communion. That begins on page 10. We'll speak it responsibly. First, what is the sacrament of Holy Communion? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ for us Christians to eat and to drink. Second, what blessing do we receive through this eating and drinking? That is shown us by these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Through these words, we receive forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation in this sacrament. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Third, how can eating and drinking do such great things? It is certainly not the eating and drinking that does such things, but the words given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words are the main thing in this sacrament, along with the eating and drinking. And whoever believes these words has what they plainly say, 
the forgiveness of sins. Fourth, who then is properly prepared to receive this sacrament? Fasting and other outward preparations may serve a good purpose, but he is properly prepared who believes these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. But whoever does not believe these words or doubts them is not prepared, because the words for you require nothing but hearts that believe. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God, our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins.
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated. As we continue now with our communion distribution, we invite all members of Good Shepherd and our Sister Wells churches forward to commune with us. As I said before, you can follow the direction of the ushers coming forward 10 to 12 to the tables. You can kneel at the direction of the communion leaders. Then you will receive both elements and a blessing and return to your seats from there. Ushers, go ahead.
Please stand. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before you suffered, you showed your disciples the extent of your love. You gave them this sacrament of forgiveness and remembrance, and you promised them that you would drink it again with them in your Father's kingdom. As we have partaken of this sacrament, show us your love and your words of invitation. Restore our joy in the forgiveness you won by your death and resurrection. And give us hope in the promise you've given of a feast to come. In this sacrament, live and rule in us, even as you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and let's sing the last three verses of hymn 659.
Heavenly Father, your son was betrayed by Judas, abandoned by his disciples, and arrested by his enemies to fulfill your plan for our salvation. Forgive us when we abandon you by our sin and strengthen us through your word and through the sacrament of your son's body and blood that we may always cling in faith to your gospel promises. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.